at our Bible study, we started a uh, unit on the book of Hebrews. And in that first lesson, we were talking about different ways that God speaks to us. I think that was the first question in the book that we uh, discussed. And uh, God speaks to us in many ways. We, you know, I won't rehash everything that we talked about that evening. But uh, some people uh, have actually claimed to have heard God's audible voice from heaven, while many people you know, have never heard that at all. I would just say that if you have never heard the audible voice of God from heaven, from you know, outside, you know it's not just speaking to your hearts, then uh, you're in good company. I've never heard that. Uh, I would also uh, submit to you that the late great evangelist Billy Graham uh, said he had never heard the audible voice of God. So, however, the Bible does say that on several occasions God has taken the opportunity to speak to people audibly from heaven. So I thought it would be an interesting study over the next several weeks to look at specific situations where that happened in the Bible, where people heard God's audible voice of heaven. Um, I have no reason to believe that the people who um, say that they have heard his voice that I'm not going to say that didn't happen uh, because it's happened in the Bible. I don't see why it can't happen to this day. Uh, but uh, of all the times in the Bible that we see that happen, one of the last times is in the book of Revelation. So uh, most people start in the beginning. I'll start at the end just to shake things up here. Uh, we will look at uh, the two witnesses. You may be familiar with those individuals. Uh, they are not given names for one thing. Uh, people sus uh, make suggestions on who they might be. Uh, but we do find them in Revelation chapter 11. And if you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 872. Uh, we'll just start at the beginning of chapter 11. And uh, these are two witnesses that were sent by God to preach the word to a world that is violently opposed to hearing the message. And we'll see what happens in these verses here. Uh, First couple verses in chapter 11 are sort of background, so I'll just start at the beginning of the chapter, and we'll read 1 through 14. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it was given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men will, from every tribe, people, tribe, and language, and nation, will gaze upon their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets have tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe has passed, the third woe is coming soon. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. 
should be no surprise to us that the book of Revelation is widely considered one of the most difficult books of the Bible to interpret just because there's so much symbolism in there. Uh, it also stands by itself as the only truly apocalyptic book in the Bible. This morning, I'm not going to get into all of that extra stuff, you know, tearing apart the symbols and what they could mean and might mean and those kind of things. I think we can learn a lot about it uh, just by uh, explaining, uh, you know, more of a, a generic sense. Uh, so that's the way I'm going to handle it this morning. Uh, I will say, though, I do am confident that this is uh, telling of future events that have not taken place. Uh, the future tense is used uh, frequently in there, so that seems to speak for itself. But the first point this morning is that the purpose of these witnesses is to preach repentance. Uh, when we read through Revelation, we can't get, uh, or uh, we can't help but get a picture of how bad the moral condition of the world will be when these events take place. And we know the world is bad now, but just imagine it's going to be that much worse depending on how much farther into the future that this takes place and we don't know when this will happen. That's why God is going to send these individuals to preach repentance so that people turn from their wicked ways and come back to God. Furthermore, we read that the hatred that the world feels towards these mess messengers of God is great. Despite that, the witnesses serve as a guide for us, and they are an example. They show us no matter how bad things are in the world around us, we still have a duty as Christian believers to proclaim the name of God, no matter what people say about us, no matter how people treat us, and so forth. There's an example of preaching repentance that is going to put everyone here to shame, myself included. And this took place in the mid to late 1990s. And it concerns a young boy named Andrew Whaley. Uh, Andrew says he was saved at age 10. And at 14, he and his friends started a weekly Bible study at their school. As is often the case with any startup ministry, Andrew soon got disappointed uh, by the lack of interest. Uh, he knew there were about 600 kids in his school, so even if you get a small portion, you know, he's doing the math in his mind and trying to think how many he could expect. Uh, every week, it just drew a small handful of students, and he got very discouraged. So he did what any good minister would do. He went to the Lord in prayer and he prayed for more interest in this Bible study. And wouldn't you know, the very next week he held the Bible study and there were 50 students there who attended. That's a pretty good ratio for uh, just starting up. And what's even better is at the end of that study where they got 50 people to turn out, 30 of the 50 came forward to accept Christ as their Savior. That, to me, sounds a lot like what the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are doing. Uh, over two years of holding his study in his school, uh, Andrew says that 127 of them came to know the Lord. When asked about his school ministry, he says, if I say I'm a Christian and refuse to live by his commandments, that I'm lying to myself and I'm lying to God. I need to go out and witness to other people because if I don't, they might go to hell. End quote. Andrew's story is one of, is a story of how one person can make a difference. He took it upon himself to organize this study. He coordinated uh, classroom time, you know, with the, the principal. He could have a certain room and at a certain time. Uh, he reserved, actually it was the school theater. Uh, he took the time to get out the word to his uh, classmates that there was this Bible study available. And... Uh, Andrew even made the commitment to get up early on those mornings rather than sleep in, as many teenagers certainly would want to do, 
and he came to school early to hold a Bible study. Carrying out any ministry is not easy, but I can guarantee you that it's even more going to be more difficult for these two witnesses in Revelation 11 to do what they need to do because the difference is the witnesses in Revelation 11 know that once their ministry is over, they will be killed. How's that for something to look forward to when you go and preach the gospel? Well, in the end, it is all about repentance. In church, we throw around these words uh, so much that sometimes I wonder if we really know what they mean. Uh, for instance, there's really about three aspects of repentance. The first one means you recognize that you've committed an offense. Uh, that's the first part. For instance, if you're driving down the road, of you're on vacation, you've never been to this town before, then you don't realize that the speed limit is only 35 miles an hour. Maybe there's an overgrown tree that's covering the sign, whatever. You missed it, you didn't know, and you're driving at 50 miles an hour. Well, you're not going to repent of your violation because you didn't know you did anything wrong in the first place. Uh, secondly, repentance means that you are sorry for the thing that you did wrong. For instance, if you go and cheat on your taxes, for instance, uh, you, know that, uh, you, know, you know you've broken the law, but if you go and rationalize it, as people are very good at doing, maybe they'll say, well, the tax code's unfair, or I don't want to pay for whatever reason, so you know, you're just not sorry for what you've done. And the third aspect is to make a conscious effort to avoid that same behavior in the future. Uh, for instance, if you cheat on your taxes one year, uh, most likely if you don't get caught, you're probably going to try it again the next year and the next year. Sort of like if I, you want an extra, well, they sort of change the forms now, but back in the day, you would uh, have your different exemptions. And if I make up a social security number for my cat or something like that, you know, if it's on there one year and you take it off, that's going to bring up a red flag. Repenting is being sorry for what you've done. And I found it interesting, the word repent actually comes from an old Latin word that means to crawl. So that gives us an idea about humbling yourself to the point of crawling because you are so sorry for what you have done. If someone walks around and holds their head up high like the world owes them something, then you don't really have that idea of crawling and it may not be true repentance after all. Um, the second point is that witnesses, these two witnesses in Revelation 11, still preach repentance despite the environment around them. And all that's going on in the world doesn't seem to phase them at all, as they just preach all the more. Uh, what happens is when we represent Christ in a public way, we automatically put ourselves out there as targets for the enemy. But the question that every Christian needs to answer is, is it worth it? Is it worth possibly losing friends? Is it possible, or is it worth possibly uh, the damage to your reputation that that might cause? In extreme cases, is it worth the loss of your life? Well, John Harper is a man who answered that last question in the affirmative. John was a passenger on the famous ship, the Titanic. And this part of the story was not told in the movie, by the way, so don't think, oh, for the next five minutes, I know the movie, I know what happened. History tells us that only about 20 of the lifeboats were used after the Titanic struck the iceberg, and that was only enough to accommodate about one-third of all the passengers and crew. I don't know if John Harper knew this fact or not, but regardless, when the, ice, when the ship struck the iceberg, he sprang into action. See, he was an evangelist, and he was concerned about the souls of the lost. He put his six-year-old daughter in a lifeboat, made sure she was safe. And then he, instead of getting in a lifeboat, he went back into the ship, and he ran around the ship warning others not only that the ship was sinking, but more importantly, he asked them, is your soul saved? John knew that that was of the utmost importance at that time. 
And uh, when a ship is sinking, what matters more than the condition of your soul? The legend has it, John was heard saying, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They may not have been his exact last words, but they are certainly his last recorded words as he was among the 1,500 people who died from the sinking of the Titanic. And I got to tell you, though, when you read John Harper's story, I mean, what a way to meet the Lord, though. You know, you give your life urging people to accept Jesus Christ in your life. It must have been quite a homecoming in heaven that day, I'll tell you that for sure. But in John Harper, we see a picture of these two witnesses in Revelation 11. And specifically in verse 5, now these witnesses get some supernatural help from God. It says, if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and devours their enemies. While these men are preaching, they will be attacked, though they will have to defend themselves in that way. They are going to keep preaching no matter what happens around them. Same goes with John Harper. Just imagine him running about in the frigid air. You can imagine how cold it was. People are panicked, thinking they're going to die, many of which did. People are trying to get in a lifeboat, anything to hang on to avoid dying. Amid the pure chaos on this ship, People start adopting an every man for himself mentality. Yet, John Harper is different from everyone else. He is concerned for the spiritual well-being of anyone there who might not know Jesus Christ. And who knows, for the next person he encounters, he could be the difference in their eternal destination. Does the scene in Titanic seem too outrageous? Well, the Titanic is going down and... Is that so much different than the culture of the United States in the 21st century here? John Harper was concerned about the spiritual well-being of 1,500 others when the ship was literally going down. Are we concerned about the other, I don't know, 330-some million Americans out there right now? Expand our perspective then. Are we concerned about the other... 7.3 billion uh, people in the worldwide. Now we've reached the last point this morning that these witnesses in Revelation 11 get rewarded finally by being resurrected. And verses 11 and 12 say after three and a half days a breath from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Well, this is where we get to the audible voice of God. And we look forward to our own resurrection as believers in Christ too, just as these two witnesses experienced. That's a reward for faithfulness, and it's our reward that we look forward to also. When I first became a Christian believer and reading my Bible and going to church, it's an area that I struggled with a little to try to understand exactly the right way to be, I guess would be. Uh, you're taught to be humble, which I did my best at that. And in the spirit of humility, I didn't think that I deserved extra riches and rewards that God promised in heaven. So, you know, would I be greedy to want more rewards in heaven for doing the things that he wanted to do? Well, the fact is God promises these rewards for faithfulness and oh, we should never become self-righteous in the fact that some people can sort of put on a fake sense of humility and tell God, you know, hey, thanks, but no thanks. Give that to someone who really wants it or needs it shouldn't be like that. We are given those rewards for our enjoyment. And so I have a feeling that if a person is going to stand in front of God and reject his goodness uh, as manifest in these gifts, God very well may call your bluff and you may spend eternity with very few of his gifts. So how do we get over these struggles? I finally 
understood after a long time, it takes me a while, but I usually get there, that I wasn't serving God for the sake of these rewards. I was serving him because he just instilled in me a sense of love for other people and I wanted to do what I could to serve him. I wasn't serving him for the gifts, but since he offers them, yeah, I'm willing to accept them and as tokens of his grace. God enjoys rewarding us for the things that we do good for him. Now going back to the witnesses one more time, imagine what they endured for three and a half years until they're finally killed. The text doesn't come out and say this. This is sort of where you have to read between the lines a little bit, but you can be sure that they're being cursed and being threatened. And uh, Well, we certainly know attempts are made on their lives, which is why they're given the miraculous defense mechanism. But the witnesses are in a very unique position because God gives them this power to spew fire from their mouths to defend themselves. And some people think maybe this is uh, uh, just a metaphor. Maybe it's not a literal fire. Other people think maybe it is an actual fire and it will vaporize their enemies. I don't really know one way or another, but the fact is that they, God protects them and he has his hand on them one way or another until their time is complete. And as believers in Christ, we also may be cursed and threatened and, or even worse, but we know that our rewards await us in heaven. And I urge everyone here to consider the spiritual condition of your neighbor's souls. In life, there are times when we need to focus on ourselves because we have certain responsibilities and we can't just ignore all the things we have to do in a day's time. Then there's times when we uh, are called to focus more so on other people. Other things require more attention. Um, some people become only concerned uh, largely about themselves and that can be a serious problem. Maybe you're flipping through the channels on television and you see a program that says how bad conditions are in a certain part of the year and maybe it's hurricane victims or an earthquake uh, struck somewhere or there's always starving children at some part in the world. Does it make us want to do our part to help or do we just turn the channel as quick as we can to find something that makes us feel good and just forget about that last thing that we saw? So, so I want to leave you this morning by just reviewing these three examples that we looked at this morning. John Harper, the man who was concerned about others amid a sinking ocean liner who gave his own life so that others could hear the gospel one last time. The 14-year-old Andrew Whaley, who was concerned about his other students, his other classmates in school. And lastly, the two witnesses. I count them one example here in Revelation 11. They're concerned about the salvation of the whole world because they know that time is very short at that time, at that point. Even so, the same people that the Witnesses in Revelation 11 are preaching to or many or could be some of the same ones that will end up killing them in the end. It's somewhat ironic. It takes a lot of love to act as any of these examples did or will do in the case of the witnesses. The good news is that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the access to the same love in our hearts that God gives us that led these in examples to be concerned for others. That love is available all the time through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who died so we could live. And it is our duty to show concern for others and to spread the love of Jesus Christ to all people. Let us now, as we close out, uh, pray for God to grant us a large measure of that same love in our hearts and in our lives to reach whoever we can in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.